Greetings. I'm Joseph Minnick. I'm a teaching fellow with the Davenant Institute. Davenant Academy is a recent initiative of the Davenant Institute in light of the recent coronavirus crisis. As you are all aware, the world has suddenly seen a massive surge of homeschooling. And so Davenant folks thought we'd step into this circumstance by offering some curriculum materials for junior hires and high schoolers that might aid parents and students who are looking for quality material out there in the interim. For my own slice of this service pie, I guess, I'll be working through C.S. Lewis' book, Miracles. Uh, I, I plan to put out uh, two to three videos a week for the next six weeks or so, basically corresponding to the amount of chapters in the book. I won't be thoroughly summarizing every argument Lewis makes. Uh, rather, these videos will just be 10 to 15 minute introductions to each chapter, perhaps prompting you with some orienting insights and questions, but largely with a goal of just helping you to internalize and digest the material yourself in your own reading. In short, I'm, I'm just trying to guide you to be a, a good and careful reader of Lewis himself. For you younger folks, this might be your first entree into Lewis' defense of the faith. Perhaps you've already read his Narnia books and haven't quite gotten to mere Christianity or miracles or any of those. One of the, one of the great things about Lewis uh, is that he, he is accessible to people who are in, you know, in their teenage years, just first coming to a kind of discursive side of life, uh, who are just beginning to relate to their faith in a more critical way. Uh, and yet you will also find him shockingly rewarding as you return to his material later in life. Lewis is, is deceptively accessible. Deceptive because he writes in a, in a very simple and common manner, but actually can, covers enormous ground in, in substantive ways and with brevity. Each time I, I go back to one of his texts as an adult, I'm always surprised to see how much deeper it is than on my last reading. And I fully anticipate, I'm in my late 30s right now, I fully anticipate going to Lewis in my late 40s and, and finding another layer of reward once again. All right, so, so Miracles, this book, Miracles, why this book? <laughs> In my judgment, miracles in themselves, that is the, the miracles, the fact of miracles in themselves, are not that interesting. Rather, it's what's around miracles that I find interesting. To, to believe in miracles is to believe that the universe and reality is or behaves a certain way. To believe that miracles are impossible is to believe implicitly many other things about reality by implication. And this is precisely how Lewis approaches the topic. He, he's not so interested in defending or refuting particular miracle claims. He's rather interested in helping us work through the nature of reality by means of the topic of miracles. S said differently, we can perhaps learn something quite general about reality uh, through working, uh, working through a particular question about reality. That is the question of whether or not miracles are possible or probable. But of course, that's a simply an abstract reason to, to work through Lewis's book, Miracle, Miracles. A, a more concrete reason is that you will soon be leaving your homes and perhaps experiencing a, a greater degree of exposure to ideas and influences outside your ordinary Christian context. And this is not something to be afraid of as such. God is, God is with us wherever we are. But it is something to be wise about and to anticipate. Uh, and I'd also want to say that having clear thoughts and ideas are not all you need when you when you go through that experience. You need to you need to learn to love God and to to serve His people, to to receive His benefits and word and sacrament, to practice the Christian disciplines, to fight your own sins, etc. Um, all of these have an important role in walking in the faith as we learn to stand on our own two feet, as it were, as we become adults in, in Christianity. Nevertheless, having, having clarified thoughts about reality is also helpful and orienting for us. And that's mostly what Lewis will help us with here, albeit in some quite practical ways, I think, as we'll see. <laughs> So along those lines, one of the reasons I think Lewis will help you is because he's a, he's a master rhetorician. Uh, and this is one of those disputes that is most argued about in mere rhetoric. That is, the topic of miracles is often defended or dismissed with mere rhetoric. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that you'll, 
you know, sometimes experience an attempt to embarrass you into feeling primitive. People like to talk about, uh, you know, your sky daddy as opposed to God. People like to talk about how you believe in a floating spaceman instead of the second coming of Jesus or, or zombie Jesus instead of the resurrection and superstition as opposed to miracles. You know, and you need to watch out for this kind of rhetoric because it often attempts to move you through mere embarrassment in a way that obscures rather than clarifies actual reality. In fact, we could talk about most scientific things with that same kind of rhetorical voice and make them look stupid, even though we believe they're real. Um, and this is where Lewis is so helpful. He's, he's just as clever uh, and will give you many counter rhetorical tools, but in a way that I think demonstrably clarifies rather than obscures our wondrous world, our interesting world. Okay, so let's, let's talk then today about the, the introductory poem in the book, as well as chapter one in this particular video, and then we'll move on to talk about one chapter per video until we get to the final video, wherein I'll, I'll discuss those few appendices he has. It would be easy, of course, to skip the poem and get right into chapter one, but, but Lewis puts this poem in here for a reason. Uh, let's see if we can, we can figure out what that reason is. I, I just spoke about rhetoric, and I think uh, putting the poem in this book is, in fact, is in fact a rhetorical move. So what can we discern here? So let's, let's read the poem together. I'm going to read the first two stanzas here. Among the hills a meteorite lies huge, and moss has overgrown, and wind and rain with touches light made soft, the contours of the stone. Thus easily can earth digest a cinder of sidereal fire and make her translinary guest the native of an English shire. What's going on here? Clearly Lewis is talking about a meteorite and has gone from uh, that, that is, excuse me, that, that, that has gone from floating in outer space to becoming a, a natural part of an English landscape. Time is, has made the rock smooth, vegetation has grown up around it, and it is now part of the, the natural scenery, if you will. Uh, it has become a thread in the canvas that is earth. And this, says Lewis, is not so strange. Uh, we, uh, Lewis says, uh, uh, here it is, uh, uh, nor is it strange these wanderers uh, find in her lap, that is Earth's lap, uh, their fitting place. That is, they, they belong there. Uh, for every particle that's hers, every particle that belongs to Earth, came at first from outer space. Uh, Lewis is saying that this isn't abnormal, a, a meteorite becoming a, a natural part of Earth's landscape, at least if modern cosmology is correct, is just the latest in a whole history of Earth's consuming whatever has been thrown at it. Uh, it, it indeed, it, it itself, that is Earth itself, just is the collection of kind of cosmic materials that have smashed together and ordered themselves within her. It's funny to think about that Carl Sagan would, would later claim that we're all stardust in order to sell an atheist picture of the cosmos. Lewis here makes a very similar observation before Carl Sagan ever made it, mind you, in order to show forth a cosmos with exactly the opposite implications. Uh, uh, so Lewis goes on these final two stanzas. Uh, all that is Earth's has once been sky. All that is Earth has once been sky. Down from the sun of old she came or from some star that traveled by too close to his entangling flame. Hence, if belated drops yet fall from heaven on these, her plastic power still works as once it worked on all, the glad rush of the golden shower. All right, so why this poem? What's going on? Why include it in a book on miracles? Here's what I think Lewis is doing. Here's my, here's my gesture toward an answer there. He's trying to get us to see that what we take as ordinary, and only because it's so common to us, is on another register, extraordinary. The, the juxtaposition between what is natural and what is miraculous is often felt to be relatively similar then to, the, to us to the juxtaposition between the ordinary and the extraordinary. But part of Lewis' whole point in this book is to say that we'll, we'll get at the question of miracles properly if we get at reality itself properly. And what he wants us to see is that reality itself, even, even what we tend to take as ordinary reality, is quite extraordinary. 
the the transition of a translinary particle into a planet or of a meteorite in the native of an Eng- to, 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 to the native of an English shire is no less extraordinary when we step back and look at it from a particular vantage point as the transformation of water into wine. Uh, the, the fact that the world looks this way, uh, acts this way, is already amazing. And, and what Lewis is doing is kind of priming the pumps of our imagination to, to see the ordinary as it really is, uh, it, even though we tend to be a bit numb toward it. But if we're, we're able to step back and see the sheer stunningness of what is ordinary, to see that all of this might have been otherwise and much less interesting. We're in a place then to see that miracles are not just the extraordinary versus the, versus the ordinary, but maybe if we could put it this way, the extraordinary extraordinary versus the ordinary extraordinary. <laughs> or said differently, if miracles are real, uh, this would be no more stunning than the world that is already in front of your face which you take uh, as non-stunning, perhaps, only because you're so used to it. Indeed, probably if you saw miracles all the time, (laughs) you'd be much less impressed by them as well. (laughs) All right, so let's take a, uh, that's that's the poem. That's what I think the poem is doing for us, priming our imagination in that way. So let's take a a real brief look at chapter one, which is is quite short, just a handful of pages. Uh, The first line after, for an Aristotle quote, is uh, also quite interesting. And I think another rhetorical setup for Lewis. The first proper line of this chapter is, in all my life, I have only, I I have met only one person who claims to have seen a ghost. (laughs) That's how Lewis starts his book. So what's he doing there? Why does he start the book that way? Okay, I think another rhetorical move. I think he's trying to distance himself from communities of superstitious people. Uh, when you see a book on miracles, our immediate frame of reference might be might be uh, what really amounts to sort of common superstition. People claim uh, to see weird things all the time. Lots of people claim to see miracles that have never happened or talk about miracle th- miraculous things as though they're just kind of floating about, uh, you know, in, in, in everyday life or something like this. That when I was a when I was a bit younger than most of you, my dad had a secretary for a brief moment in his auto mechanic shop, and this secretary chose the, the literature for the office. And the literature was a, the literature she chose to put on the, the desk there in the sitting room was a, was a bunch of angel magazines about people's experiences with angels. And wouldn't you know it, they were full of various stories of, of do-gooders who were retrospectively interpreted to have been an- angelic visitors, <laughs> but which even my 12-year-old self figured out was probably just a nice dude helping you change your tire and who left suddenly because he had you know, somewhere else to go. Or, or in the magazine's dramatization, you know, off to their next mission, you know, something like this. Uh, <laughs> so... I think what Lewis is doing is with that first line is kind of signaling to you that he's not coming at this question uh, from that kind of background. He, he's an upper class genteel Englishman. He, he's not from a community of superstitious persons and is himself not so liable to believe whatever claims are made for miracles. Indeed, the lady he mentions actually thought that she had seen a hallucination, he later tells us. She didn't even interpret herself to have actually seen a ghost. <laughs> so Lewis is a Approaching the question then from a different place, from a different starting point. He's not trying to retroactively make sense out of fancy experiences he's had. He's persuaded of miracle of miracles because of his conclusions about reality itself, not because he's trying to retrofit reality onto his experiences or traditions. And indeed, this is this is what the rest of the chapter is about. Lewis, in fact, immediately goes on to cut off two avenues for defending miracles. Uh, If you found yourself in a crowd of people and decided, and I'm not sure why you'd decide this, but if you decided to start talking about miracles, it's not unlikely that someone in the crowd would claim that they believed in miracles because they'd experienced one. Or someone might claim miracles must be true because historical testimony suggests that they must be true. So Lewis Lewis immediately cuts off these appeals as the the ultimate basis for believing in miracles. Uh, It's possible, of course, that such claims could be a sort of catalyst for a new investigation of reality, but but the claims themselves cannot be the ultimate reason for our belief. And why is that? It's, it's for this simple reason. Uh, experience can be misleading, and the interpretation of experience can be especially misleading. 
This is especially the case if we've already decided, you know, given a certain interpretation of reality that miracles are impossible or wildly improbable, you know, then obviously, you know, if you experience something, it's a hallucination or whatnot. But the same goes for historical evidence. If miracles are impossible or even intrinsically improbable, Lewis, this is his, his phrase, Lewis talks about even if miracles are intrinsically improbable, such that only, you know, absolute certainty can make a miracle claim seem plausible, then no historical testimony ever arises to that level of certainty. Our experiences can be afflicted by illusion, and historical testimony is never, just by virtue of what historical testimony is, intrinsically and absolutely certain in that particular way. If miracles are not intrinsically improbable, on the other hand. That is, if reality is such that miracles aren't intrinsically not going to happen, then the evidence of experience or of historical claims will be weighted quite differently than when we hear somebody claim about a miracle or we read a historical testimony about a miracle. You know, it's not intrinsically improbable that that's, that's a good explanation of what we're reading or hearing about. Uh, even though it's still not the case that we'd claim miracles, you know, willy-nilly, but it, but it would not be impossible or even improbable that we'd come to think it likely that miracles had happened in the past and perhaps even now in certain circumstances. And so, so Lewis' goal in this book is not to examine history or experience as such, but rather to look at reality directly. What is reality like? And if we can understand reality, perhaps we can have a more sure footing, footing to, to ask the question of whether miracles are possible or probable. Uh, Lewis, Lewis writes, in fact, uh, quote, this book is intended as a preliminary to historical inquiry. I'm not a trained historian, and I shall not examine the historical evidence for the Christian miracles. My effort is to put my readers in a position to do so. Notice the move Lewis is making here. This is the mark of a, of a good leader. He, he's not trying to manipulate you into anything. Like a, like a good guide, he's trying to train you to think well and to interpret the world well so that you can make competent and adult judgments. Uh, and that's a good reason to read Lewis as a, as a young adult who's growing up into to manhood and womanhood. Uh, so I'm just playing second fiddle to Lewis' efforts here. He's trying to train you to think about the world. And in these videos, I'm going to try and help you read him in such a way that you can maximally benefit from his tutelage. Or as the, or as the kids say these days, I'm trying to help him help you. <laughs> well, that's, that's all for our first session. Next time, we'll get into chapter two. See you later. Thank you.